Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Retelling as an Effective Reading Comprehension Strategy for Underprepared Learners. Um, so my name is Nicole. I'm the Education and Training Coordinator for Florida Literacy Coalition, Florida's Adult and Family Literacy Resource Center. Uh, this webinar is made possible through the generous support of the Florida Department of Education, Division of Career and Adult Education. So before I begin, I just want to um, show you guys your tools that you're gonna have on the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So if you, uh, want, if you bring your attention to the top left part of your panel, you'll see an orange or red arrow there. If you press that button, you can dock your panel to the side to get rid of it. If you press it, you can bring it back out. Um, below that, you'll see a little hand icon. That's a hand raise icon. So um, if I wanted to ask everyone a, a quick question, raise your hand if you can hear me, then you just press that button. So let's try it out. Just uh, click that button if you can hear me right now. Um, okay, good. It looks like most people are pressing that. All right, so next I will, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the main control panel where, where you'll see a questions box. This is where you're going to put all your questions, um, either for the content of the uh, webinar itself or any technical issues that you're having, you can type it in there. Um, and basically anything you want to type, if you want to type an answer to one of Iris's questions, you can type it in that box as well. The, uh, the next thing I'd like to um, Point, your, point out is the handout section. Uh, if you click into the handout section, you will see uh, the PowerPoint presentation for today. So if you click on that, you'll be able to download uh, the, the PowerPoint. If you are having trouble downloading it, uh, you can email me after the webinar and I can send you a copy that way. All right, so with that, I would like to introduce um, today's uh, presenter. Uh, Iris Strunk has been an educator for more than 25 years. She's been both a classroom teacher and a reading specialist in grades K through eight, and is currently a professor of reading at Northwest, Fed, uh, Northwest Florida State College. Iris facilitates reading and study skills training and is a strong advocate of using research-based strategies to teach reading comprehension. She has played a role in education as a writer and speaker for events and conferences that focus on reading comprehension and study skills. Um, so with that, I would like to go ahead and pass it over to Iris. Uh, Iris? Yes, welcome, welcome. I'm so thrilled that you're all here taking the time to uh, work on this. So again, we are going to look at retelling. It is an excellent strategy for helping your underprepared learners. And we're going to also incorporate it within this is look at the, the five finger stra summary strategy that's been revised just slightly. So, of course we have objectives. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to define retelling as a summary strategy, identify the main idea in a passage by retelling this, the text, and demonstrate the five finger summary strategy. Let's take a poll. If you'll go ahead and indicate in what capacity do you serve underprepared learners? Are you a teacher, administrator, volunteer, or other? All right, so everyone's voting now and we'll uh, give it about 30 seconds. All right, it looks like most everyone has voted, so I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So about, it looks like about 50% of people say that they are teacher, 11 administrator, 11% 11 volunteer, and 28% other. Oh, that's interesting. So the other could incorporate quite a few different um, uh, areas. Let's look now at this passage. This is from the Harry Potter books. 
if you'll go ahead and as I read it to you, think about a summary, a possible summary for this. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. So if you'll go ahead now in your question box, type in a short summary of this article. As you are doing so, try to recall as much as you can of the passage. More seconds. I'm now going to put on the screen a possible answer. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley were normal people who would not be involved in anything strange or mysterious. Would you agree that that possibly could be a, an accurate summary for that particular passage? And of course, it was an easy one. So yes, we probably all nailed it. We're going to do another poll. So now if you'll indicate yes or no, do you agree that underprepared learners have difficulty summarizing most passages? Okay, so the poll is launched and we'll give about um, 30 seconds for this poll. Okay, I'm going to share the results. And it seems like everyone's in agreement here, Iris. 100% said yes. I'm with you, totally with you. Let's look at what a summary could be defined as. Would you not agree it is a short account of main points of a text? However, there are some no's that my students seem to have issues with. Summaries are not a place for opinions background knowledge, or personal information. And my students tend to sometimes go to the opinion part and put their opinions in their summaries. That is not the place for the summary information. So how do you retell? First of all, we'll all agree that students must carefully read the test. And I, again, put in red, carefully read. My students oftentimes think they're carefully reading where they are merely using their eyes to run over some of the words, picking out what they think is important. So then my students need to ask themselves, what was this text about? The answers should be com a complete sentence or two. Can be more than two if that passage is longer, should also cover the main points and key ideas, should be in your own words. That is sometimes a problem for my students also. They'll, they'll want to borrow from the original passage too much and should not be a word or two. That ends up being the topic, not enough information for a summary. My students often ask me, should I retell everything? No, only major ideas and necessary information should go into a summary. I tell them, ask yourself, do you need this information to understand the text? If the answer is yes, then you're going to use it, put it into your own words in your summary. So what are main idea and key points? Of course, we know the main idea is what the text is about. Our students have sometimes difficulty finding the main idea. Key points again, 
are arguments or information that's used to support that main idea. And once again, my students tend to confuse key points for the main idea or vice versa. Key points may be developed or elaborated with major supporting details. As we know, major details are the ones that have to be there. It's like the skeleton of your passage. My students, I have to remind them of this as we analyze the passages. And again, you tell your students your retelling should only include main ideas and key points and not minor supporting details. And as we know, those minor supporting details are that those that information that is extra. It's the, the part that elaborates on whatever the major detail is. And of course, my students have difficulty. They identify minor details often as major details or the main idea. Here is a sample text. Let's look at it and then we're going to analyze it. A penny for your thoughts. If it's a 1943 co copper penny, it could be worth as much as $50,000. In 1943, most pennies were made out of steel since copper was needed for World War II. So the 1943 copper penny is ultra rare. Another rarity is the 1955 double guy penny. These pennies were mistakenly double stamped, so they have overlapping dates and letters. If it's uncirculated, it would easily fetch $25,000 at an auction. Now that's a penny worth having. Let's look at how to retell this particular text. There is the text again. The first step in retelling is to determine that topic or the focus of that passage. As you look through this passage, you are looking for the focus or the topic. What I do with my students is I ask them to look for which word is repeat, repeated throughout the passage. And of course, I've indicated in red that it would be penny. Look how many times it shows up in the passage. Additionally, if I could draw your attention to the word it, it also stands for penny. What happens with my students is they don't realize that it is the same word for a penny. It's just replacing it. We know it, but again, some of my students, either they never learned it or they thought they had it, but they don't realize that the word it actually does stand for the penny. So as you know, if you just count the number of times the penny shows up there, it's going to be your topic, your focus. Now that we have identified that, then the next step is to determine what that author wants you to know about that topic. And as we know, that's called the controlling idea of that passage. So there you have, again, the pennies indicated. And in the same passage, if you'll look to see, there are two different types of pennies that this article is about. You've got the 1943 copper and the 1955 die. That answers that part about what does the author want you to know about the topic. But we're not done yet. We have the two types of pennies, but there's more. So again, the more is the rarity. So now the author wants the reader to know there are two kinds of pennies and they are rare because they have certain characteristics that do not appear in the other pennies. So that is going to be part of our summary. So again, here is the text and you'll notice in blue, I've indicated again what the author is wanting the reader to take away 
from this particular passage. So an incorrect response would be the text is about pennies. Well, what's wrong with that? It's too short. It does not include any key ideas. What would be the difference with a passage that's about pennies in general and the one that you just saw? If you have too short of a summary, it's not going to have that difference that you can understand. Here's another incorrect response. The 1943 copper penny is worth a lot of money. Copper was hard to get during the war, so there aren't many of them. The 1955 double die penny is worth a lot too. These pennies were stamped twice on accident. All right, this is better than the first response that's, that's too short, but actually we have way too much detail and the reader might again get confused. So there's too much unnecessary information and the main idea is not that clear. This would be a correct response. The text is about two very rare and valuable pennies. The pennies are the 1943 copper penny and the 1955 double die penny. It's important for our students to be able to do this, to write or think through a correct summary, because as you know, on the test that they're required to take, many questions ask them to do this. Why is this better? Why is this the correct text? Because the key information is there. We've got the two pennies, we know they're rare, and then it doesn't really include all that other unnecessary information, and we do have complete sentences. Here is more practice. I like to start easy with my students. Now, I teach college students right now, underprepared. They are underprepared college students, but they still are college students. So therefore, I like to still start with something very basic so that that way they are able to grasp the concept right away. The text doesn't get into play. So we're going to look at some, some nursery rhymes, and some know them, some don't know them. It depends on um, their, their childhood. And what we're gonna do is read each nursery rhyme and then summarize the nursery rhyme in as few words as possible. Make sure that the key information is there. And then with my students, I have them compare answers. I also allow them to work in, with partners because that sometimes helps them get over the idea of, okay, I don't get this, I can't do this, because they like talking uh, to another person about what they're doing. So let's start, let's see what it looks like. The itsy bitsy spider climbed up the water spout, down came the rain and washed the spider out, up came the sun and dried up all the rain, and the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout again. Now, once again, there are certain things that you are going to want to pick out from this particular nursery rhyme. You want to know that it is a spider, and he's going up, and he's going down, and he has a problem with that down part with the rain, and then he's going up again. So it's very easy to pick out what it is that we're looking for to use. So what is the summary of this? The spider fell but got up again. Remember, we're going for the shortest possible retelling. You could have included the part about the washing by the rain, but this is exactly what happened. The spider fell, got up again, just like we're supposed to do when we encounter obstacles. Let's try another one. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And once again, as you are, are looking for the summary, you're look, picking out what you need, an egg fell and was irreparably broken. That's pretty much it. That's what happened. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to give her poor dog a bone, but when she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog 
had none. This one also should not be that distressing. The summary again, as you look at the whole thing, an old woman had no food to feed her dog. And again, the discussion could be about why did we leave out that cupboard? It's mentioned three times, but we just wanted a quick, short summary and we have it. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. Up, whoops, Jack got up. Oh, I got that messed up, didn't I? Jack got up and trot home as fast as he could. Remember, oh my gosh, I got this one messed up, didn't I? Up Jack got and home did trot as fast as he could caper and went to bed to mend his head with vinegar and brown paper. There we are. That's the old version. So as you look at that nursery rhyme, you're looking again, how do I summarize that? There it is, as I want to summarize it. And there are two characters, but as you look at it, one character comes forward as being more important. So you end up with a boy and a girl went up the hill. The boy fell, hurt his head, and bandaged it. And there you have it in a very short summary. You, you understand what is going on there. Uh, my students will ask, well, how come Jill, what happened to Jill? Why isn't she in, in there more? Well, she is. She's mentioned as the girl. The boy, he, he's there. He's got more that happens to him. So you need to have, again, the discussion about, well, look at Jack, how many times he's mentioned there. You've got the his, which they don't understand, is related to Jack and the he. And as you talk again, you'll find out that, yes, Jill is there, but Jack seems to come forward as being more important. Little Miss Tuff Muffet sat on a tuffet eating some curds and whey. Along came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. And again, your summary would be a spider scared away a girl while she was eating. This may seem like an easy exercise to you for your students, and it is. However, when you start doing it with them, since it's so non-threatening, they, they are able to see what concept you are asking them to understand. And they will be with you doing the work that's required to come up with that summary in more difficult passages. Here is the five finger summary strategy. Some of you might recognize it as the one that we learned way back in elementary school, the who, what, where, when, why, slash how. It's basically the same. And some of your students, when you do the who, what, where, when, why, how one, they're fine. They can go with it and they can analyze their passages. Some of my students, that still is somewhat an obstacle for them. So we do the somebody wanted, but so in the end. And it looks like it's so easy to do. It works for your books, your chapters, any passage that you want to analyze. Either one will work as long as they use it to analyze that passage. Remember at the beginning, I said they had to carefully read. This is one of their tools to force them to carefully read. So again, we're going to look at something that's non-threatening. This is a, a, a story I'm sure you'll recognize, The Three Little Pigs. Here it is. The somebody that we're looking at is the person who's considered to be the main character. This character drives the action. It can be a group. And again, it's the little three little pigs, all of them. That's the somebody in that particular story. Wanted. This is what is that main character or character is trying to do? What's the goal? This usually leads to the problem. So they have to identify that problem. In the three little pigs, the pigs wanted to have their own home. But, ah, there's a problem, an obstacle. And as you look at the word but, you can start talking about or reviewing those important transitions that help readers when they are looking at a passage 
to analyze what kind of passage are they looking at? How is it organized? Again, this one would come from that, that uh, uh, opposite when you're looking at something is going along smoothly and all of a sudden there's a contrast, an opposite. So this is the main problem in the story. And it's usually, but not always, in the middle of the story. It's the challenge, it's the problem facing the characters. And in the Three Little Pigs, it's the wolf. He keeps blowing down the pig's houses. Then you have so. So is a consequence. Um, you can think of it as almost like a because. Because this was this way, there's a consequence. And it's usually, again, found in the middle of the story. It's closely related to that, but sometimes my students uh, initially get the two kind of mixed up, and that that's, doesn't bother me too much because we're not looking at uh, that exact organizational part of the passage. We're looking at how does it relate as you're trying to analyze and work through the passage. And it sometimes comes before the but. There's your relationship. And again, in the Three Little Pigs, the pigs run to each other's houses to escape the wolf. Then you have to have a conclusion. So in the end, this represents the so solution or resolution to the story, the passage. Usually it's at the end. But again, sometimes paragraphs are organized such that it, it's not there. In the Three Little Pigs, the pigs were safe in the house of bricks. So now that we've got it analyzed, we figured out the story, we need to now summarize it. So we could go back, I could go back to those pages and you've got the Three Little Pigs wanted to build their own houses, but a wolf kept blowing them down one at a time. So each piggy escaped to his brother's house for safety. In the end, all three pigs were safe in the last pig's brick house. Okay, we're going to try something with you now. You're going to be reading the story. You're going to use the five finger strategy to summarize the story or the who, what, where, when, why, if that one is, is better for you. And then again, I have my students share their summaries and occasionally I do have them work with a partner. So this is the story that we're going to analyze. And when I say analyze, I actually go use the story and I work with the students and we go sentence by sentence as we do the analysis. If you look at the first word, it's first. First is a transition. So again, you could have your discussion about what does that mean? And we have organizational patterns, as you know, the time and addition. This one would be time because you have to have something ha occurring in the passage as we go through it. So first you have the plane's engine caught on fire and continue to burn. First is important. Then you're going to use that who. Well, there's no who, there's no somebody yet, but we've got a what. It's that plane. And the plane's engine has a problem, fire. So here's your first sentence that we've analyzed. You've got a plane that is on fire. Going to sentence two, when Amelia Earhart flew to a higher altitude trying to put out the fire, ice began to build on the plane's wings. What is repeated or the same from sentence one? Well, we've got a plane. If you look at sentence two, you're talking about the plane's wings. In sentence one, you had a plane's engine, but we're still dealing with an airplane. Now, what else is the same? It looks like the flying. That's the only thing that a plane can do. So the flying is, is uh, referenced, even though it's not there with a the word that, um, it's part of that plane, what it does. It's made to fly. So now 
we also have fire mentioned. Fire is, is uh, mentioned in the first sentence. Now that we've got the first, first sentence identified and the second one partially identified, we look for the differences. What's different in sentence two? Well, you have there ice. Ice is starting to build up on that plane's wing. So we had a problem in sentence one with fire, and now we have ice. We also have a somebody. The who appears here, Amelia Earhart. Now that we have sentence one and two analyzed, we go to three. From start to finish, Amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters. What is the same? What remains the same? What are we comfortable with? Well, we have Amelia Earhart, that's been back in sentence two. We've got a flight that's inferred in sentence one, and in sentence two, it says flew, which is flight. So that's the same. Then you have disasters. Disasters actually are mentioned in one and two, are they not? It's the fire, and then you have your ice. My students will, will sometimes question that. They'll say, well, disasters is a different word. Yes, it is, but it still means the same. You've got ice and fire, that's not a good thing. Disasters are not a good thing. So therefore, even though the author uses diff a different word, which they do all the time, it doesn't derail the analysis piece. We still are operating with disasters are going to include ice and fire. The next sentence, the weight of the ice on the plane's wing finally forced her to come down. You've got ice, which was mentioned before in sentence one. The plane was mentioned in all of them. And you have now her. And I have to ask my students, who, who's her? They need to make that connection that that is Amelia. And some of my students, they still don't make that connection. That her throws them. When, they, when you are trying to help them achieve good comprehension, they've got to work through those obstacles and not jump over them, not ignore them, but figure out what, what is that obstacle? How can I get through it? What can I do to make sure my comprehension doesn't suffer? So now we have the next sentence, because the clouds are so low and thick during her descent, she almost crashed into the ocean. Once again, what is the same, even though the word is not there, you've got crashing. Crashing is a disaster. So it goes right back to the sentence that talks about disaster. And who is she? Again, some of my students do not realize that or make the connection that she goes back to Amelia Earhart. So I have to help them analyze and see that that is who she is. By the time Amelia finally spotted the coast of Ireland, she was so far off course that her plane was nearly out of fuel. So now again, you've got Amelia mentioned, you've got different, it's the coast of Ireland, it's a different uh, uh, area that her plane is flying over, and she was off course, another disaster, and then out of fuel. So what you have done for your students is allow them to see how you analyze and pick apart the passage so that you make the connections so that your students can see how everything is connected as you move through that passage. If they are able to analyze, they'll be able to figure out where they go wrong if they do go wrong, where their obstacles are, such as the pronouns, and they'll be able to fix them because you've allowed them to see into your process, how do you analyze a piece of text and, and connect everything. So it could possibly look like this with the red words, some of the words that might have been picked out as they move through that particular passage. I use a lot of highlighting in my uh, classes because I want them to make those connections so that even if they, they see it's red and red, green and green, um, that's fine. Those colors help them zero in on what is happening in that 
passage. And if you look at the bottom, you've got that who again, Amelia Earhart, she's a somebody. The how was filled with disasters. There's your but. She wanted to do this flight, but there's a problem. Where was she or what in that airplane? And then what about her? You've got more on the left. She wanted what? That transatlantic flight. When did it happen? From start to finish. So that would uh, also include that in the end. And then your why part, the fire, the ice, all those disasters is your so. So this disaster has caused all this to happen. Now there is something also, as you put it together, visual, visuals help. I try to use a lot of pictures. Sometimes my students draw different things. I have them draw or I give them pictures so that when you put it together, it's there and, and students more likely will remember how we, how we put the pieces together. The research is showing that the visual part of your student is probably the part that you want to use as much as you can because pictures as that old saying is uh there they are far far more important than the words we pick up on pictures much faster than we do with words so there it is there is your stated main idea your summary of that passage there is something called the topic question answer model and it's just called that because it's exactly what we do. Remember the passage about the pennies? We went for the to topic, the focus, and you can always, and, I, and I, I encourage you to do so, use these words. These are the words that are the academic words that are telling your students what they're doing, their process. They're looking for the topic as they analyze a passage, that the focus. And the focus of the topic is that Amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight then you ask for the controlling idea what what about it what does the author want you to know about her first solo transatlantic flight and again it was filled with those disasters the ice the fire the rest of it and then you come up with that summary amelia Earhart's first solo transatlantic flight was filled with near disasters the key to this process is the analysis piece you have to do the work, all that tedious work for them, your students to finally go, oh yeah, I see how it's all connected. Because if you just ask them to read and then write a summary, retell it, or pick out the main idea, they're gonna flounder. It's gonna be difficult for them unless they already have that skill set. They have some understanding. So let's look at Wilma Ruda. Wilma Rudolph was the first American female runner to win three gold medals in the Olympic Games. Her performance was all the more remarkable in light of the fact that she had double pneumonia and scarlet fever as a young child and could not walk without braces until age 11. If you look at that passage you, and you want to analyze it, then you again start looking for the who, what, where, when, why, or the somebody wanted but so in the end as you do your analysis piece. You want to help your students figure out in that first sentence that it is William, uh, Wilma Ro Rudolph that you are talking about, that the author wants you to know about. And what did she do? She won those three gold medals in the Olympic Games. Then there's that second piece of it, that piece where um, you've learned more about Wilma and her performance was more remarkable because she had double pneumonia and scarlet fever as a ch young child and couldn't even walk without those braces until 11. So here she was that she's going to win these Olympic medals and yet she had these health issues as a child. Paragraph two, Rudolph was born on June 23rd, 1940 in St. Bethlehem, Tennessee, the 17th of 19 children, and soon moved with her family to Clarksville. At an early age, she survived polio and scarlet fever, fever only to be left with the use of one leg. 
Through daily leg massages administered in turn by different members of her family, she progressed to the point where she was able to walk only with the aid of a special shoe. Three years later, however, she discarded the shoe and began joining her brother in backyard basketball games. At Bird High School in Clarksville while a sophomore, Rudolph broke the state basketball record for girls. As a sprinter, she was undefeated in all of her high school track meets. Again, paragraph two, you would go sentence by sentence in doing the analysis piece. The, the who, the somebody, it's still Wilma. It's still Wilma Ru Rudolph. It has not changed. And she is going to be that winner of the three gold medals in, from that first paragraph. But the second paragraph details all the obstacles that she had to overcome. It's the but part of your paragraph. She wanted to achieve all this, the Olympic Games, but she had all these obstacles and bad things that she needed to work through in order to become that athlete that she did. In 1957, Rudolph enrolled at Tennessee State University and began setting her sights on the Olympic Games in Rome. In the interim, she gained national recognition in collegiate meets, setting the world record for 2,000 meters in July of 1960. In the Olympics, she earned the title of the world's fastest woman by winning gold medals for the 100-meter dash the 200 meter dash, which is the Olympic record, and for anchoring the 400 meter relay, the world record. She was named by the Associated Press as the US Female Athlete of the Year for 1960, and also won United Press Athlete of the Year honors. A remarkable athlete indeed. So what you want to do now is figure out using that chart, as we know, the somebody is going to be Wilma Rudolph. And what did she want? Well, she obviously wanted to be able to walk and run, uh, 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 overcome her obstacles so that she could go on and become this great athlete. But there was a problem. She was sick with uh, pneumonia and scarlet fever, and she wore the leg brace. She had all those health issues. So what happened? How was she able to start moving toward her goal? Her mother and family massaged her legs, and she exercised every day. Then what happened in the end? In the end, she was able to overcome her obstacles. She was able to walk and run and she won the three medals in the 1960 Olympics. So if you look at paragraph one, you could already, as you work with your students, go through the analysis piece like I showed you using the somebody, the five finger chart summary, or you could use the who, what, where, when, why that ends up doing the same thing. They work together. And you, it might look something like this as you pull out certain things that you need to answer those different areas on the chart. This is paragraph two, and you again would be doing the same type of analysis with them. You would go sentence by sentence, asking them what's the same, what's different, pointing out the pronouns that are, are stand-ins for other words that previously were in the paragraph so that they can see that relationship, pointing out the transitions that indicate time or cause and effect type of an organizational pattern, pointing out where things relate, how in each sentence something is either carried forward to the next sentence, repeated or discarded or changed with the word but or so. 
Then, again, this possibly, this is the one that talks about the leg massages. This is what you might pull out as you're doing that analysis piece with your students. And then here is the next paragraph. And there again, you have how you would do that analysis piece, and possibly these are the words that you would end up with. So, as I put it back together, this is what the whole piece looks like. As you've moved through, and with your students, you've analyzed and showed them how one sentence leads to the next sentence, and how that is that information is going to be used to come up with a good solid summary as they move through it. So it would look possibly something like this as you have done the correct analysis with uh, your students and it works out so that you have everything used. It's fairly non-threatening because the words are somebody, that's pretty easy. Most of us can answer that. What did she want? The but piece sometimes is tricky, the but and the so. The, you might have to go into the, the types of transitions, what their job is. The but usually tells you that something's going to go in a different direction. There is a problem. And then the so, that's the piece that fits along, along with that but. What's the correction? How is that? character going to be able to move forward toward that goal and then finally the end what happened how did it end up so your summary might look something like this putting all the information together from here you've got Wilma Rudolph wanted to walk and run like a normal child here's your butt she had double pneumonia and scarlet fever and had to wear a leg brace. So her mother and family had to massage her legs daily. That's what they're doing in order to move her closer to her goal. Wilma also exercised. And then here you have in the end, Wilma not only learned to walk and run with her without her brace, she became a three-time Olympic gold medal medalist. So that is a summary that's going to be effective and it is directly pulled from all the information as you work through it and analyze each each part of that passage the key is the analysis is it going to take you time absolutely this is not a quick short lesson this is where you get into the trenches with your students, you get into that passage, allow them to see how you pull it apart. Will they have questions? Absolutely. Sometimes they just, you'll have one or two that just cannot see how that passage moves forward and how you could pick that information out in order to put the whole thing together to make a good solid summary of that particular passage and sometimes you'll get answers they they go back to their what they know the details they'll pick out minor details and focus on the minor details or want to include those minor details um, the part about her she was wearing that special shoe that really is a very minor detail and some students will focus on that and want to put that into their they're retelling their summary. So the takeaway is just plan on taking the time in your classes to do this thorough analysis and allow your students to see you tearing apart the passages. And as you go through passages and they get harder, we, we started with very easy elements. The, the um, a uh, spider going up and down and with the rain came down those are nursery rhymes are simple however your goal is to make sure that your students understand the concept how do you do an al an analysis of a passage why is it important why do you have to pick 
through each sentence. They'll complain, oh, but this is so slow. It takes a long time. Initially, yes, it does. But as they get better at it, they understand how information is given in one sentence. And then in the second sentence, it's either repeated or it's changed, modified. They will start seeing the importance of, of reading thoroughly the entire passage. Because my students tend to glance their eyes. They think when, when I say, if you'll please read this, this paragraph, that it means just kind of running your eyes over the words. And then hopefully you'll get something out of it, pick out a few things. But it won't be correct, not the way that our tests are made up now. They've got to be accurate in what information they identify is important for that summary, that retelling, so that they can answer those types of main idea questions in the tests that they have to take. Yes, again, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's well worth it. It, it does end up uh, getting them to the point where they can read faster. I know that doesn't sound possible as they're analyzing, but the analysis piece, if it starts, they start doing it and using it and it is done accurately with your guidance, they will be able to read faster, they will be able to com comprehend better, and their test scores will go up. It's remarkable, and I know you have that feeling when you look at some students and you think, oh my gosh, I don't know how they're ever going to be able to pass this test they have to pass, but if you give them the tools and you work with them on those tools and you show them that they do work, they'll see it, they'll start doing it, they'll use it, and they'll have a way to overcome an obstacle in that passage. It won't stop them like now it does. An underprepared student coming to an obstacle in a passage will just quit. Or he'll say, oh, I'll just reread it again, but nothing else will happen because nothing else has changed. This is the tool that's gonna make that change happen. These are, I often get uh, asked, where do you get your passages that you use to help your students? I have included in that PowerPoint at the end this, this slide. And if you click into it, it will give you different levels of passages that you can use for your students. And some of them are very, very interesting passages that will, will, they'll want to read them. And some of them, again, are not so interesting, but they need to do those too. So you have that on your PowerPoint. We are finished. So we have plenty of time if there are some questions. Doesn't look like we have questions just, uh, just yet, Iris. Okay. I do want to uh, remind everyone real quick um, that there that the PowerPoint in full is going to be available on the handout section. And uh, again, if you're having trouble uh, downloading it, you can email me and I will uh, send you uh, a copy of the presentation. Okay. All of you will receive this PowerPoint, so you'll have it so that you can use with your students and modify it however you want to. And then again, all those links at the very back of the PowerPoint are included for those passages in case you do need to have some different articles that you want your students to read and you want to do it together so that that way you can mark up and use, uh, I use highlighters a lot, mark up those passages so that they can identify what you are trying to show them. If you do not get that PowerPoint, it does not uh, open, please, please contact Nicole and she will send you another copy. And if you have any questions, my, my email is at the bottom and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Or if you find you're stuck when you try it with a student, email me and I'll see if I can help you get unstuck. Thank you so much for attending. I, I, I so appreciate you going through and, and learning about these different strategies.
please, please try them with your students because they are research tested. They're nothing I came up with. And they do work for helping your students gain that comprehension piece. All right, thank you guys so much for, for attending our webinar today. Um, as a quick reminder, if, uh, if you guys um, could visit our, would visit our website, uh, floridaliteracy.org. If you had not signed up for the second webinar um, uh, that Iris is doing this week, she's doing um, strategic, I'm sorry, one sec, let me pull it up, strategic main idea instruction to improve comprehension. Um, that one's going to be on Friday at the same time at 1 p.m. Uh, if you have not signed up for that one yet, please, uh, you can shoot me an email. Uh, if you signed up for this one already and not the next one, you're not going to be able to go into the same link, unfortunately, to sign up for the second one. But if you send me an email, I can sign you up for the second one uh, manually. Um, so uh, I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone uh, with a survey. Please, please, please take the survey. Um, it, we really do use your feedback to, uh, to kind of uh, inform our webinars for the future. All right. Uh, thank you all so much for joining, and, uh, and I will be chatting with you all via email. Thank you.